Hi everybody, it's Dr. Lori. How are you? I'm here answering some questions for you. All different topics, all different things, and I'm going to answer some questions. So let's get started. Let's see what we've got. These questions come from uh, comments on YouTube. They come from social media. They come from all different places, website, all different. So this person asks, a woman bought a piece at an auction, and after she bought it, a guy approached her and offered to buy it from her. Her kids were with her and urged her to sell it. Should I have sold it? Okay, well, there's a couple of things. My first initial reaction is don't do it. This happens a lot. You're at an auction. You bought the piece of the auction. Pay for the piece and go home. Oh, but I could get a big good bargain and I paid this much and he wanted to give me more. Well, then why didn't he outbid you during the auction? That's my first question, right? Is it a gender thing? Is this guy just trying to put a little squeeze on you? Your children are not helping. <laughs> I know you love your kids. Everybody loves their kids, you know, okay. But they're not helping in this situation, right? If you wanted the piece and you bought the piece, now you want to resell it right there on the auction floor. There are a lot of people who go to auctions just to do that, you know, just to basically see what's out there and see who they can get something for for a little bit of money. So this actually happened at one of my events some years ago when a couple brought in a very large Pennsylvania Impressionist painting. And this particular painting was pretty valuable. Well, before I started my appraisal event, two people came up to them and said, don't have her appraise it. I'll give you $8,000 on the spot for the painting. All right? Guess what the painting was worth? The painting was worth $100,000, and they offered th that couple $8,000. $8,000. So not even 10% of what it's really worth. Be careful of these people who are coming into these environments and trying to get stuff from you. So I would say, no, don't do it. I would also say in this particular situation, you need to know what you had. And if you bought it at the auction and you paid, of course, the buyer's premium at the auction to buy that particular piece, you know, I would say you bought it at the auction. There's a reason why you wanted to buy it. Whether you're keeping it or whether you're reselling it, take it home and next time don't sell it to that guy. All right, <laughs> next. Hi, Dr. Lori. Thanks for your videos. Where do I sell my antiques? Where do you sell your antiques? Well, off the top of your head, you sell your antiques on eBay, Etsy, Tios, Reddit, social media, Facebook groups, uh, Marketplace, um, uh, Tios, uh, let me see, uh, Replacements, um, Cherish, First Dibs. I mean, those are just the ones off the top of my head. Mercari, Let Go, any of these. Oh my gosh, Dr. Lori, I didn't know there were so many of those places. You could sell them through, of course, an estate auction house. You could sell them in all different places. You can have an estate sale with, you know, folks who run estate sales. There's lots of places. If you want to sell online, what you need to know is you need to know what you've got and what it's really worth, right? Then you know how to best market it. That's how I can help you. So there's lots of places to sell it online. It's not just one place. It's never just one place. Okay, next question. What else have we got here? Hi, Dr. Lori. How do you make out a name signed on a painting that's hard to read? Okay. I get a lot of people who have this problem. And this is really pretty common. I get this question a lot. So, you know, you see those signatures from those artists and you don't know. One of the things that I had to be trained in for the PhD in art history is I had to be trained to recognize certain artist signatures. Have you seen John Singer Sargent's paintings? You might have seen his paintings. Very famous portrait artist of the early 1900s. And let me tell you, we had to recognize his signature because his signature is so like a mess that you wouldn't even notice it. Many, many artists we would actually be told to recognize just the signature. The other point is some pieces of art aren't even signed. So then you have that problem. But if you want to identify for yourself without any of my background or any of my studies or any of my stuff, you want to do it, I want you to get a piece of paper. I want you to get a pen or a marker or something. And I want you to actually try to mimic, literally mimic what you see. So if you see a stroke that might be a T, but you're not sure, maybe it's a J, I want you to try to mimic that stroke. Copy what you see. As you copy it, your hand and your brain are actually going to make the form. And they're going to make the forms and connect the letters. And all of a sudden, you're going to see, oh, that's signed Thompson. Or, oh, that's signed Jackson. Or whatever it might be. But actually, you moving your hand and going through those letter strokes or those letter forms is going to help you to identify that particular artist. 
From there, then what you have to do is you have to look at the actual painting. I'm assuming these are paintings or pastels or drawings with a signature, right? Then you have to look at period for the materials, period for the subject matter, and try to match up what you think might be the artist with other artists having that name in a certain time period. So this is where you get a little bit, gets a little bit difficult. It's not only about the signature either. And if you have a piece and you see that that particular material that they're signing it in is not correct, like I've seen, you know, 19th century landscape painting signed with Sharpie magic markers. If you got a 19th century landscape painting, it shouldn't be signed with a Sharpie magic marker. You know, it's a fake. So be aware of that. But Try to do the letter forms yourself. You'll be surprised at how much you can figure out. Next question. Good morning, Dr. Lori. Your website's very informative. Well, thank you, because we've all worked very hard on the website and on the YouTube channel. I've been selling many of my, quote, nice things that I don't want anymore, I like that, online for a good while now. But what stumps me is how do I ship large furniture? Can you address this topic for me? Well, yeah, I can. A couple of things I want you to think about with respect to large furniture, and this goes back to my museum experience. First of all, museums are great resources. That's why they're there. They're not only there for, you know, champagne gallery openings. They're there also to be a resource. They're bright people who are working there, and they're trying to help you learn about art, history, and antiques, culture. Couple of things. First thing, ask your museum if they have a reference. If they can give you a reference for an art shipper or for a furniture shipper or for somebody who is well known in your area to ship or, you know, move fragile antiques. That's first. The second thing I want you to think about is, of course, regular partial shippers. If your piece is less than 70 pounds or 108 inches, many of the regular shippers like UPS and DHL and even in the postal surface might be willing to, in fact, ship your pieces. And this is the most important point. Your buyer is paying for insurance, shipping, handling. Okay, so your buyer is paying those costs. You, it's your responsibility as the seller, you have to make sure that it's properly insured, that it's well packaged so nothing gets broken. You do not want to send something that you sold to somebody and it gets broken. It's a big headache. So you want to make sure that you have all that covered for the buyer. So you're helping the buyer and the, and, and the buyer is actually helping you. Um, those are the things you want to think about with respect to, to furniture. The last point that you might think about with respect to furniture is you can make a, a situation or coordinate a pickup. You know, maybe it's something so big that you're saying, wow, it's going to be not be cost effective for me to ship this, you know, 19th century ice box to this person. So maybe you can make, of course, a opportunity for them to drive out and get it, right? If that's the case, you want to make sure that you have security in place for yourself if somebody's coming to your home or to your place of business. So think of these things, have a conversation with your buyer or your seller, and I'm sure that you can get that done. Next question. Hi, Dr. Lori. I visit a lot of coin collectors online forums. Okay. They always say that any coin put into jewelry loses its value. It's a major loss of value. Is this true? I'm just curious. Well, here's the issue with coins. It's the circulation of coins. If the coins are circulated, okay, so if they've been not kept and protected, but if they've been circulated, traded for a product, traded for a service, right, circulated, then in fact value is lower than a coin that's in condition that's considered mint or it's never been circulated, uncirculated. Once it goes into a piece of jewelry, you know, you put a big gold $20 piece, you know, from the 1880s into a necklace or a pendant, once it goes into that, now you have a setting around it, and that setting could cause damage to the integrity of the obverse or the reverse, the front obverse or the back reverse okay, of the actual piece. So you want to be aware of that. Once it's set into the jewelry, it could damage the coin, so you don't want any damage to the coin itself. Um, typically, people will say about coins, oh, well, you know, I can, just, I can just sell that piece for the smelt weight or the amount that gold is selling or silver is selling at that time. But again, good coin collectors and good jewelry collectors know that design value and the actual coin value speaks to the history and is worth a little bit more than, of course, the smelt weight. So if 
if you're on those online forums, it's always good to, you know, interact that way. But be be careful because a lot of those folks, while they're interested in the topic, they may not be experts. Next, what's next? Hi, Dr. Lori. I'd like to see more of your videos talking about the difference between modern and vintage. Okay, now you're getting into our historical antiques vocabulary. Now, vocabulary is important, right? I would watch shows like Antiques Roadshow and I'd see these so-called experts talk about patina and they'd be talking about wood and the oily buildup on wood when patina is an application of color onto a piece of metal sculpture. It has nothing to do with the application or the oily buildup on wood. It's an application of color in a foundry. And people say, that's patina, that's patina. And misinformation, it's kind of like the old fashioned telephone game, the misinformation keeps going down the line. So remember, that example of patina is where experts were telling you that it has to do with wood when it doesn't. It only has to do with metal sculpture. So that's one thing. The other thing you want to think about with respect to these kinds of questions and questions like this is this vocabulary. Modern in art historical circles is said to be any time after the Renaissance period. So when I was teaching in universities and they would say, Laura, you're going to teach mod the modern sections this semester. I would know that I was going to teach from about 1450 to the present, considered modern. Vintage is a word that basically means any time that is not 100 years old. So anything up to the 100 year mark. So right now, it would be 100 years or less, right? Not 100, but 99 years or less, right? Than the year that we're in right now. That's considered vintage. Once you get to 100, then that is antique, and that's a totally different century mark, and that's different from vintage. But modern actually dates all the way back to the Mona Lisa and the Renaissance. So people are surprised by that. But modern and vintage are relatively different. Some people call something mid-century modern, and something that's mid-century modern is also vintage. So the vocabulary can be a little bit difficult. All right, next. I'll try to make it easier for you right here. Hi, Dr. Lori. I have one question, and then there are three more questions, which always cracks me up. I have one question. I want to know if I have a chair restored, would that affect the value? I want to know, would it make the value go up? I want to know, would the value stay the same? Or I want to know if the value would be lower? Okay, that's four questions, actually. Anyway, are you counting all the questions? That's okay. Anyway, uh, this is really easy. It depends on how good a job the restorer does. So, you want to have your chair restored? That's great. I want you to make sure that you know how good the restorer is. Why do I say this? Restorers oftentimes will show you before and after pictures of their work. They're very proud of their work. A lot of them are very good at, at restoring antiques, and a lot of them are not so good. I have seen pieces be totally ruined by people who were expert restorers. So I want to see some pictures, and you should too. Show me your work. Show me what you've done. You know, get the references, if you will. So I want you to think about that with respect to the restoration. Uh, a restoration will not automatically make the value go up. It could devalue it if the restorer does a bad job. Usually it doesn't stay just the same, right? That depends on market influences. You know, if you have something that you had restored, but the market isn't really interested in this piece at that particular time, it's not always that the value goes up or goes down. Um, with a good restoration project, you could increase value, but it has to be done well. So think about all of those elements when you're thinking about restoration. Also remember that if a piece can't, you have to remember whether or not you just want that piece for display or you want that piece to be functional, right? So do you want that, Lou, I don't know, Madame de Pompadour, Louis the 15th side chair from the 1750s to actually hold somebody in the 21st century to sit on it at dinner all night? Or is it just for display? There's different levels of restoration as well. Okay, next question. Dr. Lori, you're a gem. Oh, that's nice, right? I love your little goth after you pass a comment. When I first heard it, though, I thought it was your photographer or your videographer, and I thought, doesn't she hear him? That's so disrespectful. He shouldn't do that. She needs to talk to that person. Then you go, this person goes on to say, I love that you tell ordinary people to stop giving things away. I love old pottery and transferware and plates. 
And I like that you keep telling us to open the cabinet doors so heat will escape. You're a joy to listen to. Well, that's very nice. Let's talk about the first part of this. Uh, this little goff that I make after I comment, it's kind of like a t sound, right? Kind of like I'm giggling a little bit. Um, since I was a very young child, I have had this speech impediment. My parents was, tried so hard. I went to all different speech therapists as a child, and I never really got rid of it. You'll notice when I'm talking now, I won't do it. I tend to do it when I'm sort of engaged in a conversation back and forth, or if we're having kind of quick, witty remarks. You'll notice that on and off, many people have made comments about it. Some have not been as kind as this woman was, or this man was. And um, I do try to work on it, but I am aware of it. The videographers that I work with and all the folks who help to make these videos possible, it's not just me, people. The people who do that are professionals, and they do a lot of work to make sure that all this information gets to you. So of course, it is not them. It's all me, and this is my cross to bear, as, the, as people would say in my family. It's one of the things that I have to deal with. I've got lots of those, as many of us do. But that's what it is. And yes, I do try to be cognizant of it, to be conscious so it doesn't bother people when I'm speaking publicly, because I do a lot of public speaking, but it is what it is. So I'm sorry if it bothers you. I hope that you will realize that the information far outweighs that little sound that I make. Okay, and then this question. Hi, Dr. Lori, hope you're doing well. I'm doing great. I love all of you. It's fun to be here. Could you give me just a ballpark about this Crown Trafari set of costume jewelry of what's it worth? I don't really need an appraisal. I just need to know what I have. One more time, I'm going to define appraisals for you. An appraisal is not just a value, a number, a dollar sign. An appraisal is a correct identification. An appraisal is an authentication where it tells you, in fact, is this piece a real crown trafari piece of costume jewelry? Because there are fakes out there. And is it, in fact, something where you can have an identification of condition, of quality materials, of age and time period? It's an expertise. So an appraisal is not just, oh, it's worth this, oh, it's worth that. And anybody who's doing that isn't really appraising the piece for you. Have to tell you all about the history, the background, the materials, the condition, you know, all of these types of elements that go along with, of course, evaluating pieces. So, you know, a ballpark, the ballpark's big, right? There's right field, there's left field, you know, there's home plate. The ballpark's big. If you want a ballpark on something, you would have a very, very big value range that doesn't really help you at all. First thing you have to do, get a correct identification and an appraisal from me. I hope these questions and the answers to them and a couple of the tips that I threw in there too have been helpful to you. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.